as Jesus was being tempted in the desert, he said this, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Welcome to our morning service. Tea and coffee are in the hall afterwards if you have time to join us. Let's begin by worshipping God with the words of him 482, come let us to the Lord our God with contrite heart return. us all to come, you who live in the shelter of the Most High God. Lord God, you are our refuge and fortress in whom we trust. We abide in the shadow of the Almighty One. We call on our Lord in time of trouble. And so we pray, God of love and God of light, you would deliver us from all our troubles, protect us from all our harms. Answer us when we seem confused, rescue us in our hour of need, and satisfy us with your salvation. And this prayer we make not just for ourselves, but for the whole world, especially in places of conflict this day. You have made yourself known to us as the Creator and Sustainer, and in Jesus you revealed your undying love. As we enter this season of Lent, Help us to reflect on your words and scripture, and give us the faith and courage to follow Jesus by actively engaging with the world for justice, by sharing equally all that brings life to each human person. Save us from the temptation of making other things our gods, whether it's money or possessions or status, and thinking that they will give us some kind of influence misguidedly. Rather, guide us by your Spirit to a deeper experience of your love. 
Faithful God, you have made us all children equal in your sight, but sometimes we have discriminated. Forgive us, we pray. We confess our failure to share your word, and yet you have entrusted us with the gospel of truth and reconciliation. Walk with us now in the way of righteousness, we pray. Help us to trust in you. And Lord, as you made all things good, may we seek peace and justice for the whole world. Help us to resist temptations and use the resources you give us for others rather than for ourselves, guided by the example of humility and trust which Jesus himself showed as he was tempted in the desert. These words we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Do you like stories? Do you like books? Well, you probably know that on Thursday was World Book Day. Did you know that? Because we were in the library the day before, and um, there were some parents with, uh, with children, and they were borrowing some library books. And I think it was for World Book Day, and I was asking them if any of them were going to dress up as a favourite character. Did you do anything like that? Yes. Who, who did you, which character was it? I was the cat from the little bird. Right. Did you do the same? I don't know. Well, if you saw on Thursday lots of little Harry Potters or something going around the time, you'll know that you'll know those in the Well, I've got some pictures now of, uh, of books and characters, and we'll see the character first, and you have to see if you know the name. So the first one is, this one, these are some well-known, well, well-known to children, it's not what I don't know, characters from... It was sad to hear this week of the death of Shirley Hughes, who was a, quite old, and she'd written so many children's books and also illustrated them. She was a great illustrator and drawer of all the pictures are in her own books as well. There's one. Now, do you know who that is? I think it's Mr. Yeah, Bradley and Robbins. Yeah, You've got it. Yeah, there we are. Well done. Yeah, Mr. Granny. That one's quite easy. It's an old picture. Yes, it's an old picture of Harry Potter. That's one of the original ones, I think, isn't it? Now, that one I wasn't sure. I don't know where it is. I read it at school. You read it at school? I forgot as well. It's my Tony Fletcher. Right? Oh, Tony Fletcher. I forgot. What's the name? The Christmas Horus. I forgot the name. Uh-huh, okay. I think got that one, yes. You know them all. That's super world. I think there's a run more this one. Well, you know, I, I read in a book recently that the first book you ever read in your life can influence your life. And it made me think, what was the first book I ever read? And I did remember going to the, the public library in Hoyk. I don't know, I was quite young, maybe about your age, and I borrowed a book. And it was called Volcano Adventure. And it was a ripping yarn about boys going and exploring volcanoes in the Far East. And, going down into one of them in a diving bell and things so they could inspect the, the molten lava. And, uh, you know, it really was a, a kind of boy's own story with lashings of ginger beer and all that kind of thing in it. And, um, you know, it took me back and I decided, that, and I found one on eBay or somewhere, it is. Two pounds eighty-two. I think it was sixpence when it was first published. And Willa Price has written lots of books on the same theme with some of the same characters, and they're all something or other adventure. 
So it really took me back and, you know, maybe that was one of the things that influenced me to do geology, I don't know, but I really, the first book I ever remember reading, an old one book now, but it's still worth it. And I read it again when I got my second-hand copy, and I really enjoyed it. Well, you know, books are amazing because they can take us into a different world, can't they, you know, in our imagination. And I read about different ways that you can enjoy a story, apart from just reading a book. Here are some <coughs> suggestions of what you could do. You could take a book that you love and use your imagination to write the next bit of the story. What happened afterwards? Hmm, interesting. You could stop reading the book at a certain point and imagine what happened next. And then go back to the book and see if you were right. It's <laughs> a good one. Uh, you could draw a character from a book. You know, some of them have pictures like these ones, so we know what the, the, the writer thought they looked like. But if there's a book that doesn't have pictures, you could draw the characters yourself. Or, even if they have what you think they look like, draw the characters. Here's one other. Read out books aloud to your friends or family and give a different voice for each character. And one last one, and this could be risky, go to the library, to a shelf, close your eyes and just select a book at random and make that the next book that you read. <laughs> that could be an interesting thing to do, couldn't it? Maybe something you really enjoy, maybe something you wish you'd never picked. But just a kind of random book. Well, reading is big. We're fortunate to be able to have so many books and stories. And of course, some of the best ones we find are in the Bible. And it's great to know that um, youngsters as well as older people read the Bible and read the Bible stories. Um, and when there are children's Bibles, sometimes we give them out to people. With the Little Nippers group, we have a special one for Christmas with Christmas stories for children and we're doing the same Easter time. And um, it's great to be able to read them because not only are they enjoyable, but they're God's way of speaking to us and telling us about the things that are important, the things that are good and the ways that we should try and live our lives. Now our next song says, and these are the words of Jesus, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Now, someone suggested, and I asked Robert about this, that we sing it in a round or in sort of two parts. So we could divide, I think, I think two is enough, we won't do any more than two, so maybe this half and I'll, I'll kind of divide myself in half. This half do the first line, and then after, when do we come in? After the chorus. At the chorus. So when, when, when the first group start the chorus, the second group start the chorus. Oh, that way. Okay, right. Okay, we'll do it that way. So we're all singing the hymn together. Yes? Yeah. But at the chorus, this side sing hallelujah, hallelujah, and this side repeat the verse. That sounds okay. Yeah, I think we'll have this thing. So seek you first the kingdom of God.
is taken from Micah chapter 6 verses 1 to 8 and Matthew chapter 23 <coughs> verses 23 and 37 to 39. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the most important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You, shall have practiced the la you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we pray for the peoples of the Ukraine and also for Russia who have been forced into this conflict. Comfort and console all who have lost family members and also be with those who have left their homes as refugees to find safety elsewhere. We see the devastating effect that war can have on a land that was peaceful. We give thanks for the solidarity of the Ukrainian people and leadership and pray that they would also feel the support of other nations around them. Strengthen them and help them in their struggle against the forces that bear down upon them. We pray for those who are helping the injured and bereaved. Bless them in their labours even in the midst of a war zone, often with limited resources. We pray for reporters and journalists who risk their lives too. We thank you that they can bring us accurate reports each day of what is actually happening. We pray too for the people of Russia, as many families will be receiving the news of the death of a young member of their family in the Ukraine conflict. And may the church in the Ukraine, an ancient church, find a way to minister and speak the words of the Prince of Peace. We pray for the global community and its leaders, asking that those with power and influence would do all they can by peaceful means to bring an end to this war. And above all, we pray for the cessation of war and of violence there. Loving Father, closer to home, we pray for those known to us who are suffering or bereaved at this time. We remember people who have lost a loved one. 
And we pray for Andrew Martin and his family. And pray that you will come for them in the sad loss of Arthur. Grant them your peace and your strength at this time. We also remember those who are ill in the congregation and in our circle of friends. We pray for healing and wholeness, and that they may know the strength and comfort of your presence each day. We remember some people who are in care homes or hospitals where visiting is either very restricted or stopped altogether because of COVID, which makes it so much more difficult if their loved ones cannot visit. We pray that the time will soon come when this will be a thing of the past and we can live life more normally, one with another. Today is International Women's Day and we thank you for all the women and girls who reveal to us your love and your grace through what they contribute to society. We pray your forgiveness on places and situations where women are discriminated against or abused just because of their gender. Some do not receive a proper education or health care. Others are forced to work in situations which are intolerable. Lord, bring justice and freedom to them, we pray. And remind us that you have created us all equal in your image. So inspire us to work towards a world where all can thrive, women and men alike and your promise of fullness of life will be realised. We ask this in all our prayers, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next time is Come Down, O Love Divine.
of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the book which we're using for our Lent studies, Isabel Hamley, who's a vicar in England, tells the story of growing up in a very large family. She says, believe it or not, that she had 50 first cousins, and those were just the ones on her father's side. Some of that was great because there were so many cousins to visit and play with. But she said, as they began to grow up, some differences emerged. Some branches of the family were more well off than others, and had nicer clothes, and could afford expensive toys and holidays. Others couldn't, and had to make their own entertainment. And she says that she was one of the more fortunate ones, but even because of that, she was often picked on by some of the others. Have you ever experienced that kind of thing? A situation that's made you say or hear the words, that's not fair. My older sister always claimed, and still does to this day, that as children, she got away with nothing, and me as a baby in the family got away with murder. Is that something you've ever experienced as a younger child, as your older sister? I see someone nodding there, Adam. I ever said that to you, your older sister's denying it. <laughs> well, she says, I was spoiled. Really? Me? You can understand those feelings. You know, and if parents even seem to favour one child over another, or if they say things that suggest, for example, that the, the baby in the family made the family complete, as if there was something incomplete before, when the older child was there. We can all bear resentments and hearts about things like that. Love can be blind. There's a book about family dynamics that I once read called, it's got the great title, Black Sheep and Kissing Cousins. And I suppose we all fall into one of those categories. We're either the close ones, the kissing cousins, we, we can't wait to see each other and we love each other, or we're well, as a borderer, I couldn't possibly comment on the black sheep in the family. These are examples of what we think are unfair in our family relationships, but of course there are far greater injustices in the world. Some people will go to bed hungry tonight, while we throw away food because we've got too much. That's not fair. Some people who are now grown adults have only ever known life in a refugee camp. We have safe and warm homes and beds to go to. That's not fair. The list of injustices in the world is a very long one. But what can we do about it? In Lent, which we've just started, we think about Jesus' 40 days in the desert when he was tempted and resisted evil. It's interesting that it was there in the desert that he was tempted. Not on the green hills of Galilee, which we sometimes sing about, not in the buzz of Jerusalem, but in the wilderness. And it's often in the wilderness in our lives that we are aware of our vulnerability and our needs are laid bare before God. Yet in the words of an old proverb, the further you go into the desert, the closer you come to God. It's also interesting that um, our word desert comes from the Greek word for uh, sorry, our word hermit comes from the Greek word for desert, hermos, because it was often into the desert that monks and mystics would go to draw closer to God. We sometimes still talk about going on a retreat. In fact, the Presbytery organises occasional retreats for its staff. But it's not a retreat in the sense of withdrawing from the world or civilization. It's more like something that Thomas Merton once said. It is a very great thing to be little, to be little. And it's often in the wilderness, whether it is a physical desert or a wilderness experience in our lives, that we can get more of a sense of God's presence and greatness. It can be a time when, like our famous verse from Micah says, we can walk humbly with God, in the sense of trusting and depending on Him. Micah also says we are to act justly, we are to do justice. It's something active, it's something practical, it's something to be done, not just something we say, oh yes, I believe in that, 
It's something we actually have to do. Although sometimes we're better at recognising injustices, aren't we, than actually putting justice into practice. But the Bible sees justice in very down-to-earth terms. For example, another prophet, Amos, talks about how God hates false weights and measures. It's not fair to be cheated or shortchanged. As a teenager, I had a Saturday job and a summer job in an ironmonger's shop. I still smell, I love the smell of paraffin. We had an old-fashioned set of scales to weigh things, you know the kind. And believe it or not, people bought screws and nails in those days by weight. A pound of six-inch nails, please, for example. And by the way, they were sold in paper bags, no plastic bags. The scales had weights to put on one side, the big steel ones for the pounds, no kilos either, the smaller brass ones for the ounces, so you put the weight on one side and then you would fill the paper bag with the nails or whatever it was they were by until it just tipped the balance. I remember my boss, who was a very generous man, would put an extra nail in to well and truly tip the balance. It wasn't just tottering, he would make sure that there was not just the right amount but just a wee bit more. A bit extra rather than a bit less. He was acting justly. Generosity to him was more important than profit. And because of that, he had very loyal and faithful customers. They knew they would never be shortchanged by Mr. MacDonald. On one occasion, a person came in to complain about something they'd bought which they said didn't work. And they'd actually opened it and started to use it so it couldn't be resold, and they wanted a refund. I was standing there, I didn't have another customer at that time, and I knew full well, and he knew even better, that we didn't sell that thing. But he gave the customer a refund anyway. Now he'd have been well within his rights to say, I'm sorry, we didn't buy it here, you know, can't help you, but he just looked at the price tag. He lost the money, but he kept the loyal customer. Now in business terms, stupid decision, you can't run a business like that. I well know that, so did he. He could have been absolutely correct within his rights to say no, but he didn't. He took the line of generosity, thinking it was more important to keep the loyalty of the customer than a few pounds or whatever it was the thing cost. <coughs> The verse in Matthew's Gospel which we heard has Jesus denouncing people who were exact to the nth degree. They gave tithes of all the little garden herbs, mint and dill and cumin, but they ignored the big issues of justice and mercy. And sometimes we've got to be careful that we're not so nitpicky with the little things that we miss the big picture of God, the big picture of justice in the world. In any discussion of a fair and just world, there's another verse which is very fundamental. Genesis 1 verse 27. God made us in his own image, male and female. Someone once called that the Magna Carta of humanity. In other words, it's the basis of all human rights. And it reminds us that we have to treat everyone as being made in God's image. This is what Isabel Hamley says about that. We cannot speak of justice unless we engage seriously with the fact that every single human being, however objectionable, unpleasant, strange, offensive, uncomfortable or different, is made in the image of God. Every human being, regardless of age, characteristics, abilities, choices, beliefs and so on, is made in the image of God. This has profound implications. It affirms justice is about dignity, worth, freedom, recognition, participation, decision-making, and integrity. And the rest of scripture reflects this sense of infinite worth of the human person. They're great words, but as I read them, I thought, oh gosh, isn't it difficult? Let's remember then, the next time we meet someone who we think is objectionable, unpleasant, strange, offensive, uncomfortable or different, 
Just remember that they too are made in God's image, no matter how sometimes that image is marred or distorted. Not easy, is it? She gives a personal example. She worked for the probation service and she had to write reports for judges for people who were coming up for trial. One such person was a young man who had a list of convictions involving cars, drugs and offensive weapons. And he had that long list and he was only 18 years old. He came from a difficult background, but he said to her that he couldn't believe anyone like her would want to try and help him. He'd never known that before. Nobody ever wanted to help him. Why would she? She feared for his future, and right enough, later on, he killed someone and spent decades in prison. As she wrote the report for the judge, she said this, I pondered again and again, what is justice? How do we see people like him rather than just cast them aside? How do we help someone learn to love and to be loved? Remember, he thought nobody at all would ever want to help him. Then she talks about the impact on other people and down the generations. But it needn't be like that because, you know, we're not determined by our genetics but by grace. It's not our genes which determine who we are but, but God. Love and grace extend to a thousand generations, says the Bible and proclaim the vast superiority of grace over retribution. She says this, the link between sin and brokenness can be conquered and transformed, provided we see love and justice being held together. As a young boy in primary school, I remember another incident which I thought was very unfair. The teacher decided every week that she would give the gold star to the person who got the highest marks in the test. But one week she decided to give it to the pupil who had improved the most, not the person who was at the top of the class. My childish mind didn't think that was fair, because the person who got it that week was way down the list of marks, <coughs> whereas some of us, just saying, we're near at the top. But you know, the people in the top, or at the top, could get the gold star week after week. This may have been the one and only time when that pupil was given any kind of encouragement. Well, a short time after that, we moved away to a different part of Scotland, and I have no idea what happened to that pupil. But maybe that was just the encouragement and pat on the back that they needed. And for all I know, they may have gone on to win a Nobel Prize. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, as now, and shall be forever. World without end. Amen. A closing hymn is, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
blessing from the church in the Ukraine. Dayomo volium, Dayomo dolium, Dai dobrovo stitu, Shastia, Dai mose narodu, Im yonhaya, yonhaya nita. Bless us with freedom, bless us with wisdom, guide us into a kind world. Bless us, O Lord, with good fortune, both now and forevermore.